Welcome to the Political Cesspool, known worldwide as the South's foremost populist radio program. And here to guide you through the murky waters of the Political Cesspool is your host, James Edwards. Welcome back to the Political Cesspool radio program, everyone. Our award-winning broadcast out of Memphis, Tennessee, AM 1380, WLRM radio, and syndicated on the Liberty News radio network and their AMFM affiliates across the country. The political cesspool, as seen on CNN and Fox News, as read about in the Los Angeles Times, the London Times, and other comparable publications. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's first hour and an incredible interview with Dr. Kevin McDonald of California State University, Long Beach. I appreciate Keith Alexander for his service and helping me with that interview. Joining me now in the co-pilot seat, Mr. Bill Rowland, our good friend and co-host, and also... Uh, with, uh, it's a great uh, and esteemed honor to welcome to our program for the first time a man who is an author, a patriot, former World War II veteran, former Jeopardy grand champion and father of Academy Award winning director Mel Gibson. Hutton Gibson has spent three years in the seminary and dedicated his life to defending the faith of our fathers, something that is near and dear to our hearts as well. We're going to be talking with Mr. Gibson this evening about the manifestation of politically correct heresy in the church as well as the secularization of the Christian faith in general. Hutton Gibson's books include the titles Is the Pope Catholic and the Enemy is Still Here? Both of these are available autographed and for purchase at HuttonGibson.com. Mr. Gibson, thank you for accepting our invitation to appear. It's certainly an honor. A pleasure. Bill Rowland, that being said, I'd like to welcome you also to the program, and let's uh, get things kicked off the right way with our very special guest. Well, James, thank you. Uh, it's good to be back on the show again. I've missed the audience, and uh, I hope that the audience missed me a little. And it's really an honor for me to be on the show with Mr. Gibson. And I tell you, I have a question. Uh, Mr. Gibson, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. Okay, well, sometimes our connections go a little sour, so (laughs) I I never know whether uh, I can be heard on the air or not. But uh, your book is The Pope Catholic. Basically addresses uh, current heresies in the Catholic Church and the turn of the Catholic Church after the Second Vatican uh, towards heresy. Can you explain a little bit to us about the Second Vatican and when the heresies began to creep into the Catholic Church at the very highest level? Well, I think uh, they must have been creeping in for some time. Uh, we, had, we almost had a Masonic Pope in 1903, but uh, the Emperor of Austria stopped it with a veto before the, uh, the man got enough votes. There were four, four countries that had a veto. Uh, Austria, Hungary, well, for the Holy Roman Empire, France, Spain, and Portugal. Because uh, a pope who was politically opposed to any one of them could make a, an awful mess of things in the... Uh, climate of the day and uh, but anyway uh, at, uh, they broke loose into the uh, the open at the death of Pius XII and uh, John XXIII called this council for no reason whatsoever except to destroy the church we've got to open the windows he said and let in the bats <laughs> Interesting. It, well, now the the Second Vatican was a distinct break from previous Catholic doctrine and tradition. In what ways was the Second Vatican really a liberalization, and I should say, I guess, a humanization of uh, Catholic Church doctrine and Catholic Church practice? Well, they went to work and re-examined. They said they were going to re-examine every doctrine of the Church. With one exception, and I suppose you can guess that that was papal infallibility, because they needed that for a a bluff. And the thing is that John himself was not available, or pardon me, not eligible for the papacy, having been apostatized as a Freemason. 
years earlier. And uh, so, so his record is such that he he promoted Freemasonry everywhere, and he's the first pope that ever died to the great plaudits of Freemasonry. Oh, we lost our friend. That's a, that's well, now the the Second Vatican uh, clearly introduced uh, doctrines which I think you know most people would recognize, even people who are not Catholic as being a liberalization of, of Catholic policy and of Catholic uh, uh, beliefs. Now, you talk about the infallibility of the Pope. Didn't actually the Second Vatican distort, or the Popes themselves distort, the concept of infallibility? Well, it's uh, been uh, distorted by the people who accept it more than it binds. The Pope is infallible only in matters of faith and morals. If he expresses a political opinion, you can relegate it to the usual garbage that comes out of any man, anybody that's uh, in the public eye. But I think the, the impression is that the infallibility of the Pope uh, is, a, is a personal infallibility, and that's where the Second Vatican or where the doctrine has been corrupted. Well, that's corrupted there because it is not a personal. It goes with the office as a means of preservation. It's uh, When you look at a religion, if it isn't infallible, it can't be true. And nobody else has ever claimed it but the Catholic religion, and it claims it for its legitimate popes. Well, now, the, I notice that one of the things in your writing that you bring up, and, and I'd like to ask you to sort of um, uh, elaborate a little bit on this concept. I think it's, it's familiar to most of us who are conservative in our, in our beliefs and, and Christians. But uh, the, the concept of modernism you describe creeping into Catholic doctrine, particularly uh, through the vehicle of the Second Vatican. Exactly what do you mean by modernism? Well, it's the idea that uh, Jesus Christ and his apostles left us a, uh, a skeleton thing, skeleton, and we built on it, and we continue to build on it as we get more intelligent. Evolution enters into this, which is garbage. I don't know any more than my grandfather. Maybe uh, things like... Uh, <laughs> When, how to turn on an electric light switch. But more machines, more engineering stuff, but in the line of knowledge, just plain knowledge of whatever there is out there, we haven't progressed. So the, the idea of modernism in terms of in, interpreting that word through uh, Catholic belief, for instance, would be that we're still perfecting the faith, in a sense yes, that man idea. is perfecting yes. the faith. Yes, we examine it, and we add to it, and we interpret it, and so and so, and we are getting brighter as we go, whereas the, the fact, the obvious is, the opposite is obvious. The education today is wretched compared with what it was when I was a boy, and it wasn't that good compared with when my grandfather was a boy. Right, in, the t in terms of the actual development of the intellect, as right. opposed to rote learning or, or even technical uh, understanding of certain things. Right. Well, now, the, um, the Catholic Church, I'm going to quote one of your quotes from your book, I think from the preface. Subversions have provided the climate and constructed the seedbed for the luxuriant growth of modernism, which you say is the synthesis of all heresy. Um, yes. Now, that synthesis being the idea that man perfects the faith instead of the faith perfecting the man, I understand. What uh, specific points of modernism do you think have, have had the most uh, destructive effect on the church and the faith? Well, the idea that they can change these things and that, that with the change is improvement. Uh, whereas when you go to a religion, especially the Catholic religion, you have to say 
that he came right from the hand of Christ and is perfect, and that he knew all the days to come, and he didn't make allowances for any changes. He said when he left, go teach all nations everything that I've taught you. Uh, Mr. Gibson, Bill, we are coming up on our uh, first break of this hour, so we're going to uh, put the brakes on the thing right there, and we are going to continue on with Hutton Gibson, and we encourage everyone to take a look at his website. Very well written, very scholarly. You can come into possession of his autographed books there, HuttonGibson.com, and he'll be our guest when we come back right after this. Right after these messages. Jump in the political cesspool with James and the gang. Call us tonight at 1 866 986 6397. And here's the host of the political cesspool, James Edwards. Continuing on with tonight's uh, second of three hours in uh, the live broadcast edition of the Political Cesspool, Saturday, January 9th. I'm James Edwards, Bill Rowland co-hosting with me this evening as we continue on with our interview of Hutton Gibson. Check out his work at www.huttongibson.com. Uh, Mr. Gibson and Bill were involved in the previous segment of a uh, discussion of the Catholic faith and some of the... Uh, liberal policies that have come to afflict uh, the Catholic Church, and we are going to later bring into play some more contemporary political issues and get uh, Mr. Gibson's thoughts and uh, prescriptions on it, what exactly our people can do to take back the church and take back all of our institutions, including perhaps uh, even our government. Uh, but, Bill Rowland, until then, back over to you. Uh, Mr. Gibson, I think there's, there's one pope who particularly embodies all of the modernists visions or all the modernist heresies within the Catholic Church, and certainly that would be the media superstar, John Paul II. And clearly, I think we see that any any Christian could see that John Paul II engaged in heresies, such as paying uh, 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 homage at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, and also kissing the Koran. Um, could, I mean, what is your, you're looking from a devout traditional Catholic position at John Paul II. What do you see? He was a complete plant. He was a Russian agent or a communist agent from the beginning. He's the only bishop that could get out of Poland without any trouble during the communist control. And uh, he certainly pushed it. Was there any connection? Uh, did he have any connection, Cardinal Wotiwa, to the uh, to the Masons or any particular groups? Uh, obviously, he must have been working uh, somewhat with the communists, and as you say, in order to have such um, free passage between East and West. Oh, yes, and and he insisted at the Vatican too that communism be not discussed because he said he had to deal with them, which is nonsense. You deal from strength. Well, I can remember that somehow he managed to pose himself as something of a hero of uh, the Solidarity Movement and of the subversion or of the overthrow of communism in Poland. So actually the opposite was true. He was actually working with them the whole time. Uh, th this is one thing about our last five. They have uh, several facets to their character and their actions and they don't seem to the left hand doesn't seem to know what the right hand is doing and the feet don't seem to know what either hand is doing uh, Hutton what would be your critique of the current Pope now he caught some uh, I guess you would call it politically incorrect uh, flap at the beginning for his involvement uh, in, in World War II but uh, apparently he obviously has to be a team player here in order to, to keep his papacy, is he not? What, what's your and, critique? And, and to be employed as a, as a cardinal in the first place. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, there. They, they all get in there, and they're all, the whole bunch at the top are, if they're not outright queer, they're, they're uh, 
supportive of it. They do nothing about the terrible things that have been going on among the clergy and the bishops. See, and I wish we had a Catholic church or you know, anyone in, in a position of extreme power, as the Pope is, to really come down hard on these abominations, homosexuality, uh, abortion, so on and so forth. It just doesn't seem as though we have a strong Christian voice coming out of the Vatican these days, and this is something that concerns me. And is the current Pope progressively worse than John Paul II? Are they getting progressively worse, or is, is, is he about the same, in your opinion? Uh, what do you see there in terms of the progression of it all? They're getting worse all the time. Now, this fellow was one of the periti at Vatican II, one of the people there to instruct the, these poor ignorant bishops how they should change the church. You know, the first thing they did when they got in there, they had this Ashi uh, Lienart, who was a known Freemason, uh, get up and uh, refuse all the documents. They wanted to make their own documents up. They weren't uh, there to look at the other stuff that was there. And so they chucked out everything, and the only thing left for them that was not part of the, what would you call the, the agenda, was this thing on the liturgy. And the, they simply pushed that through. Well... And uh, see, this fellow has not changed his stripes or his spots or anything. He's the same heretic that he was then, okay. all the way through. Well, see, and this is the thing. Yeah, I had the opportunity to have a very pleasant uh, private phone conversation with you yesterday in uh, preparation of, of today's interview. And one of the things I told you was that a as a younger man, I had always hoped that if we lost all of the other institutions, that we would still have a stronghold or a last uh, bastion, a fortress with the church. But it seems as though the church has been infiltrated uh, in the same way that the media has been infiltrated, that the government has been infiltrated, that academia has been infiltrated. What can we do as Christians and as constitutional conservatives in order to regain our institutions, Mr. Gibson? Well, we uh, look at what they've done and show that they are in contravention of all our former doctrines. Uh, the, that synthesis of all heresies, that's not my phrase. Pius X called modernism that. And uh, Pius IX had put out a long series of uh, condemned propositions of the modernists. And uh, so had Leo XIII, and his was uh, 40... Condemned propositions taken from the writings of a gentleman named Rosmini Cervate. And believe it or not, the new church has canonized this man. <laughs> With 40 condemned heresies under his belt, this new church comes out and canonizes him. Well, see, I mean, and that therein lies, you know, a symptom of, of, of the problem. It's, a, of course, a greater disease than that. This is just one of the manifestations of it. But, but again, I mean, what can we do? What can people uh, like, like yourself do? I mean, obviously, you've written books about it. You're, you're speaking out of it in interviews. But what can, I mean, there are a lot of people listening tonight who want to become active. They want to become part of a solution. What would you advise them to do in order to do some good in, in reclaiming reclaiming our institutions, what would you say to the listener tonight who wants some marching orders? Boycott. Boycott what? The whole doggone official Catholic Church. It's all up in the air, and it's not going to come down in, in a normal spot. You can bet your boots. So basically, withhold support, financial support or otherwise, from these right. institutions that have apparently gone to war with itself, or at least with the people who support it, the, you know, the, the average uh, parishioner who is in support of the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church is at war with him, and, and really the faith that he holds. Right. It's a completely different group, and it has all the control. It will not listen to anybody. But you know, when, when this stuff started, 100,000 priests quit. Exactly. They That's weren't it. all chasing women. They said, this is not what I signed on for, goodbye. Well, uh, you know, so, all right. Well, we've got to take a break right there. A lot of questions, and, and I appreciate your candor uh, thus far. We're going to uh, 
uh, regroup here. Uh, we've still got a couple of more segments uh, tonight with Hutton Gibson. It is our esteemed honor to have him as our guest this evening. Uh, we encourage you to check out his website, HuttonGibson.com. Ladies and gentlemen, this man has, has come on this program, made himself available to you. We want you to support his good work. Uh, check out HuttonGibson.com. You can get some autographed books there. Bill Rowland and I will be back to continue this interview with Mr. Hutton Gibson right after these words from our sponsors. Stay tuned, everybody. Don't go away. The political cesspool guys will be back right after these messages. Get on the show and express your opinion in the political cesspool. Call us toll free at 1 866 986 6397. Welcome back to the program, everyone. Saturday evening, January 9th. We are live. Red hot and rolling, uh, unrehearsed and uncensored as always here on the Liberty News Radio Network. You're tuned into the Political Cesspool radio program. I'm your host, James Edwards, co-hosting with me uh, for the remainder, uh, the remainder of the broadcast. Bill Rowland, our very special guest, Hutton Gibson. And we have been talking to Mr. Gibson again about the manifestation of heresy in the uh, Catholic Church as well as the overall secularization of the Christian faith in general, and along those lines, I'll turn it back over to my colleague, Bill. Mr. Gibson, the Apostle St. Paul wrote that we battle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. And this leads me to the question of the Antichrist inside of the Catholic Church. What is the spirit of Antichrist in the Church today, in the Christian faith, and who are the responsible parties? Who are the antichrists that we face, uh, even if they be of flesh and blood? Well, the uh, people who have taken over the church, and it's been taken over like every legitimate government in the world from the top. It's the same plot. Why would they vary the uh, the method? And it seems to work. Yeah, you know, that's something that we've always said, Bill, and I'll turn it back over to you. It seems as though uh, Christians, Gentiles, uh, members of the West, uh, European Americans, uh, paleoconservatives, seem, we seem to be defeated at every turn, at least over uh, the last century, to be sure. And one thing that we have said is that we must begin studying and mimicking the tactics of the left, of the people who have been successful in taking over our institutions and taking over the church. They have been incredibly uh, successful and victorious, and we would do well uh, to learn from them and uh, begin implementing pages from, from their playbook. But, uh, Bill, I digress. Back to you. In any event, there must be a, a spirit in the church that is a negative spirit, a dark spirit. And what do, what do you think is in the soul of these uh, priests, these cardinals, these antichrists. What, how, what is it that uh, is in their soul that has turned them so far away from Christ and so, so deeply into uh, the heresies and the apostasies which they practice? Well, they, they were bent that way, and they are organized. You know, if the communists take over a labor union, they're there, they do all the work. Everybody listens to them because they're there, they're doing everything. And eventually uh, people seem to think, well, they are uh, uh, competent, let's let them run. But see, we have never figured on anything like that. We never figured on, though the, it's in the, in the uh, New Testament that there will be an apostasy, it says before the end, which of course is necessary because it can't happen after the end. <clears throat> and uh, it's pretty well described in uh, Paul, St. Paul's uh, second epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 2. And, and his uh, remedy is hold fast to the traditions, traditions which you have learned from us. 
And I appreciate that sentimentality, and certainly that's something that uh, we try to practice in our lives as as best as we can. Uh, but let, let me ask you this, Mr. Gibson, one of your books, which, again, ladies and gentlemen, is available uh, for purchase, autographed, The Enemy is Still Here. Who is precisely the enemy? I mean, if we're going to go and confront these people intellectually, ideology, uh, with, with, with our ideas, who is the enemy? Is it an abstract force, or is it a specific group of people that we can readily identify? It's uh, the whole government of the church in Rome. You might find an occasional Catholic somewhere outside of Rome, but they're in complete control in Rome. And they are spreading their heresies, and they are canonizing their devotees by the thousands, and uh, without proper confirmation or anything of the sort, uh, they start with the uh, bit in their teeth, and they think, this is wonderful, we have freedom. Well, our freedom is theirs to obey, obey the proper authority, God. And if we don't, there is an awful penalty attached to it. Hey, uh, these people don't seem to worry about the penalty. They may have kitted themselves into thinking there is no hereafter. And uh, Mr. Gibson, let me ask you a question. I, I don't want to sound too conspiratorial or, or uh, you know, give the impression that, that I'm trying to, to be sensationalist here. But there was talk, for instance, that uh, John Paul I was murdered by this group of uh, uh, heretics and, and apostates. What, what are your feelings on, on John Paul I and his death? Well, he wasn't so great either. He was he had gone heretical. But see, they had a bank which Pius X started up in Venice, and the Vatican Bank sank it. It was a, the equivalent of a credit union, and nobody in Venice was in the pocket or the uh, of the bankers. They didn't. They would support each other, and this thing ran very well. And. Marcinkus, I believe, the uh, archbishop, the one they call the gorilla, the guy from Chicago, or Cicero, rather, which, of course, is across the street from Chicago in Al Capone territory. And they called him the gorilla because he was a large fellow. And uh, he was engaged in the Vatican Bank, and he sank the uh, his credit union in Venice. And down came the cardinal from Venice, and they had blood in his eye to get rid of the people to get rid of his bank. And coincidentally, they were doing a lot of other things, too. And I'm sure they got rid of him. In fact, uh, his body was discovered, what, around 7 a.m., and the undertakers had been waiting in the street for the call for since 5 a.m. Things like that, which showed up in David Yallop's book, which I think targets it pretty well. It was a financial deal with him more than a, uh, uh, a doctrinal thing. So it was, he was just part of the same corrupt system and just became a victim of it, I guess, sort of like a mafia don who, yeah. uh, you know, is, is taught in the, uh, the conspiracies of other mafia dons, in a sense. Right. Well, now, the, when we talk about enemies of the church, obviously we have to come to some conclusions about uh, those who are not of the Christian faith at all and those who uh, hold the Christian faith in utter contempt. Uh, notably, of course, we know that the Muslims uh, uh, enslaved Christians for years and have, have suppressed Christians. And, and of course, there is a, a very great hostility uh, against Christianity among uh, particularly secular Jews. I mean, do you see these, uh, these threats uh, coming at us from outside the faith, uh, as as dangerous as what's going on inside the faith? Well, they, they have their people inside doing their work. The, a good many of these people who are in, in Rome are Freemasons, which is a grounds for ejection, excommunication. You join the Freemasons, you're out of the church. And so, therefore, John 23rd was not a, eligible to be a pope. He was a Freemason. 
And Paul the sixth, you could say the same. Well, well in, in in talking about the Freemasons, who is who is at the core of the Freemason leadership? Uh, who, who basically are giving the marching orders here? Well, that's one of those things you 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 don't find out who they are. Pretty hard to pin them down. Well, one thing that you said, Mr. Gibson, that I agree wholeheartedly with is that uh, these people, these antichrists, uh, people who hate Christianity, have their agents within the church, which I think goes back to something that we're, we were talking about earlier, at least that I was referencing earlier. Do you think that there's a correlation there and part of a, a, a greater plan? Do you think that the same people who are... Uh, actively engaged in the attempted destruction of the church and the faith, do you think these are the same people who are actively infiltrating our government and academia, Hollywood, etc.? Yes. One word answer, yes, and, and so do I. Well, uh, that being said, we've got uh, time for one more segment with Hutton Gibson. Now, we're about to come uh, up on another commercial break. It seems as though the commercial breaks always uh, come upon us a little bit faster <laughs> we're in the midst of a riveting interview with an uh, uh, esteemed guest. But we are going to take that break and we will return and conclude our interview with Hutton Gibson of HuttonGibson.com right after this. I'm James Edwards. Bill Rowland will be back with me in just a moment. Every night, every day long. Don't go away. The political cesspool guys will be back right after these messages. We got Welcome back. To get on the political cesspool, call us on James's dime, toll free at 1-866-986-6397. And here's the host of the political cesspool, James Edwards. Welcome back to the show, uh, the final segment of tonight's second hour. We still have an hour to go this evening, although this will be our last uh, segment with uh, Hutton Gibson, and we are very... Again, pleased and honored to have him with us tonight. Mr. Gibson, as I said in the previous segment, or excuse me, in the, in the first hour of tonight's show, those who best understand the strength of a tide in a nation are those with the courage to swim against it. And I applaud you and salute you for all that you've done with your life, speaking out on controversial matters and telling the truth in love. I can only hope that I will live a life as accomplished as yours has been. And I certainly appreciate uh, the viewpoints that you've shared with us thus far on the church. These are viewpoints that I certainly agree with to a large degree, and hopefully our audience is being uh, educated as much as they are being entertained. Uh, but now I'd like to shift gears for what little bit of time we have remaining and talk a little bit about contemporary politics. You've certainly uh, injected yourself into to that as well, and uh, Bill knows a little bit more about that. Yeah, yes, Mr. Gibson. I noticed, um, you know, for instance, on your website that you uh, were uh, very favorable towards Ron Paul in the last election. And what do you see in terms of American politics? Where is the, where is our hope? And and um, give give us your ideas on Ron Paul and his movement, which has actually grown into the Tea Party movement, and it seems to have. Uh, awaken people to a lot of dangers uh, in this country, and are people are actually beginning to take action. Well, somebody has to say something once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> but Ron Paul, what's your you know what's your opinion on him? Obviously, you 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 favored him in the in the last election, or had some nice things to say about him. What uh, what about Ron Paul in particular impressed you? Well. Uh, it, Nobody else was there that was uh, worth a vote. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, he certainly did, uh, I think, bring a new force to, to politics in terms of his ability to get up and tell the truth and address the real po problems in this country as opposed to the, uh, the staged problems that we face and the staged solutions. But in, in terms of the direction of the country... What uh, most people believe now, I think, that things are going to get worse before they get better. What do you see happening in the country 
uh, over the next four years under the Obama administration? Are we going to be gradually or, or even suddenly thrust into a more totalitarian system? And what are, your, what are the danger signs? Well, uh, our industry is disappearing, and uh, it takes a while to get rid of it all, but I think they're capable of doing it. Uh, they certainly do not have any of the country's welfare at heart, or any part of the country. They're out to destroy it, the same as the people in Rome are out to destroy the church. And there again, I think, is the correlation, and it, it seems as though you always have a common denominator in these matters, if it's, if it's anti-Western, uh, if it's anti, anti-Christian. And I, I, again, Mr. Gibson, you know, we understand that our people have a power, we have the, the, the ability to boycott and withhold our support of certain institutions and uh, – you know, certain certain policies that we don't like, but what more than that do you think the people listening to this radio program tonight could do to engage themselves in some sort of a solution? I mean, what would you have people do? Well, uh, or is there anything they can do? I mean, that really is the million dollar question. Certainly, if I knew an answer, I would. I would. I would. It gets less and less they can do all the time. But one thing they better not do is give up their guns. There you go. Now, see that that right there is a great uh, <laughs> a great word of advice coming coming directly from Hutton Gibson, and certainly this is a program that uh, ardently defends the Second Amendment. But but anything else, or is that really the, the best thing that people could do right now? Well, it's one of those things. Uh, in Russia, they proceeded. You know, they turn around at two in the morning. And they didn't have any alarm system where people would gather and support the people that were being raided. If they could rig up something of that sort, a regular alarm system, where when uh, one bunch is uh, besieged by some uh, government agency which doesn't belong, and uh, federal agencies in particular don't belong in the states. That's right. Absolutely oh, uh, right. Mr. Gibson, that's one thing I wanted to ask you about. I noticed on your website that uh, you had mentioned at a We the People conference in 2004 that secession is the best option for, uh, you know, stopping government excess and stopping government uh, tyranny. Um, your ideas on secession, real quick, before we go. Well, uh, secession is... Uh... See, there were certain powers delegated to the federal government by the states. And uh, the gov- federal government has gone ahead and seized a lot of them. One of the delegated things was the coinage and uh, distribution of money. And it's a delegated power. And the federal government had no right whatsoever to hand it over to a private bank like the Federal Reserve. You are absolutely right. I'll tell you what, if you're willing at some point in the future, I know we purposefully wanted to focus on a vastly important topic, that being the church tonight. I would love to talk to you more about contemporary politics because you're certainly speaking our language, and it's so refreshing to hear a man of your stature speaking on on things that seem to – to just fly over the head of of the average citizen and the average voter. I mean, they have no understanding about the Federal Reserve and the the great us, uh, usurpation of power that the government has has, has taken, and the the obliteration of the Constitution that they are engaged in. I mean, this is just uh, <laughs> well. You want to focus on what's wrong with America? I mean, we we could keep you on for a couple of weeks and never scratch the surface on that. I guess. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of people that are up on that. So I try to stick to the religion thing because. Uh, I don't think there's too many of them in my field that are that will agree with me. They're, they're all trying to work out some deal with the so-called pope. And uh, he can't be a pope because he's not a bishop. And he's not a bishop because they changed the sacrament of holy orders about 1968, and he was made a bishop in in the 70s when it was too late. He's, he's as a... Uh, a man-made sacrament that put him in. 
Now, the sacraments, according to the Church's definition, were instituted by Jesus Christ to give grace. And no man can create something to give you grace. He doesn't have it. He's had no, no control of it. Well, and these are just truly basic, uh, you know, almost basic fundamental doctrines of uh, of our faith, and un- unfortunately, these are things that uh, are, are too easily forgotten now. And, and certainly, uh, when it comes to uh, Catholicism in general, you are an authority on the matter. I appreciate uh, your your traditional standing on these issues. And coming back full circle and in summation, I mean, obviously, you were brought on this program tonight to talk more about that. Uh, your books, or two of your books, uh, which are available. Now, there are some free downloads, I understand, of some of your other works uh, available at HuttonGibson.com. But if people are interested in learning more about a topic that, as you mentioned yesterday in our private talk, I mean, it's a just a, a huge topic. I mean, we, we, we barely scratched the surface tonight. But if they do want to learn more, uh, you have two books uh, for sale, which are autographed. Is the Pope Catholic is uh, the first uh, title, the second being The Enemy is Still Here. Uh, Mr. Gibson, a final word from you to the audience tonight about why it is important that they learn more uh, from your website and from your books. Well, they're not going to hear it anywhere else. Even the people uh, that were raised Catholic, supposedly, from the late 50s on, were not properly instructed. And uh, they don't pass it on because what they have is not worth passing on. You've got to go back and look at the original. And, that's, and that's what I stick to. I have never invented anything. The original is handed down from Jesus Christ was good enough uh, for for you. It should yeah, be for, good enough. For the 19th centuries, it was good. Now, suddenly, we're brighter than our ancestors, and we can tell what's good for us. Well, I certainly don't believe that. It's great to know that you don't believe that either. Ladies and gentlemen, check him out at HuttonGibson.com. Uh, Mr. Gibson, again, extreme honor to uh, interview you tonight, and Godspeed to you as you continue your work. Thank you very much. Hutton Gibson, everyone, uh, great honor. And Bill Rowland and I will be back for the third and final hour this evening. Don't go anywhere. Still another hour forthcoming tonight in the political cesspool. You just heard from Hutton Gibson, father of Academy Award-winning director, and actor Mel Gibson. That was his dad. And we're going to talk more about it. We're going to break it all down. What a show we've had this for. The third hour is still coming. Stay tuned. The third hour of tonight's installment of the Political Cesspool coming your way right after these messages. They cold the rising sun. 